Hello, my name is Richard Fury, and I am the Chief of the Division of Rheumatology at Northwell Health in New York. I will present results of the long-term extension study of anafrolumab for patients with systemic lupus. These data were presented at the 2022 ACR Convergence and published as a manuscript in Arthritis and Rheumatology. Safnello, also known as anafrolumab, is a human IgG1 kappa monoclonal antibody that inhibits interferon signaling by binding to the type 1 interferon receptor. Safnello is indicated for the treatment of adult patients with moderate to severe SLE who are receiving standard therapy. The efficacy of Safnello has not been evaluated in patients with severe active lupus nephritis or severe active central nervous system lupus. Use is not recommended in these situations. Before discussing the long-term extension, I want to discuss key clinical trial data leading up to this extension study. Anafrolumab was approved based on the results of three 52-week randomized double-blind placebo-controlled studies, of which there were one phase two trial, MUSE, and two phase three trials known as the TULIP trials. The study designs were similar for the pivotal phase three TULIP-1 and TULIP-2 trials in adults with moderate to severe SLE. Both studies were randomized and placebo controlled, and all patients who entered the studies continued on standard therapy. Anafrolumab or placebo was administered intravenously once every four weeks, but in TULIP-1, two different doses of anafrolumab were tested, 150 milligrams and 300 milligrams. In TULIP-2, only the 300 milligram dose was tested. The 150 milligram arm was evaluated for dose response in TULIP-1. It is not approved at this dose. In both trials, mandatory attempts to taper oral steroids to 7.5 milligrams or less per day between week eight and week 40 were required for patients receiving prednisone 10 milligrams or more per day or equivalent at baseline. Tapering was permitted for patients receiving doses at baseline lower than 10 milligrams per day. In all patients, glucocorticoid doses were required to be stable from week 40 to week 52. The primary endpoint for TULIP-1 was the SRI-4 response rate at week 52, whereas in TULIP-2, the primary endpoint was the BICLO response rate at week 52. The composite efficacy outcomes from TULIP-1 and TULIP-2 are displayed on this slide. In TULIP-1, the primary endpoint, SRI-4 response rate at week 52, was not statistically significant. In TULIP-1, BICLA response rate was a pre-specified secondary endpoint, but not formally tested and results are descriptive only. However, in TULIP-2, the primary endpoint, BICLA response rate at week 52, favored Safnello over placebo with statistical significance. In TULIP-2, the SRI-4 response rate was a pre-specified secondary endpoint, but was not adjusted for multiplicity. Therefore, the results are descriptive only. Exposures to Safnello 300 milligrams and placebo in patients in the 52-week phase two and phase three controlled trials are compared in this table. Adverse reactions occurring in at least 2% of patients enrolled across the three clinical trials, MUSE, TULIP-1 or TULIP-2, included upper respiratory tract infections, bronchitis, infusion-related reactions, herpes zoster, cough, respiratory tract infections, and hypersensitivity. Infusion-related reactions for Safnello included headache, nausea, vomiting, fatigue, and dizziness. I will now review the long-term extension, or LTE, study of patients from TULIP-1 or TULIP-2. A unique feature of this design is that it was placebo controlled. To the best of our knowledge, this three-year study was the first long-term placebo-controlled extension trial ever performed in patients with SLE. To be eligible for inclusion in the TULIP long-term extension, patients must have completed TULIP-1 or TULIP-2 through week 52, met all LTE eligibility criteria, and reconsented to join the study. Patients who received any dose of anafrolumab in one of the predecessor studies received anafrolumab 300 milligrams in the long-term extension. 
Patients who received placebo were re-randomized one-to-one to receive either anafrolimab 300 milligrams or placebo in the long-term extension. The LTE population had an approximately four-to-one ratio of patients receiving anafrolimab 300 milligrams to patients receiving placebo. During the LTE, adults received blinded intravenous anafrolimab 300 milligrams or placebo every four weeks for up to 39 doses, alongside standard of care treatment administered at the investigator's judgment. The LTE was designed to reflect real world clinical practice by allowing investigators to add or change background standard care treatment, including immunosuppressants and glucocorticoids. However, use of cyclophosphamide, other biologic drugs, intravenous immunoglobulin, or intravenous glucocorticoids was not permitted. As shown here, patients received one year of treatment in the initial TULIP study, followed by treatment in the LTE from years two through four. There was an eight-week safety follow-up period. The primary objective of the study was to evaluate long-term safety and tolerability of anafrolimab in these patients. Exploratory outcomes included the SLEDA 2K, Physicians Global Assessment, Glucocorticoid Use, and the SDI Global Damage Score. Flare incidents and severity were also assessed. Limitations of the study include that it was not powered for statistical comparison of safety between groups and events with longer latency period would not be captured. There was a potential selection bias as only patients completing a TULIP study and thus potentially doing well were eligible. There was no imputation for patients who discontinued or received additional immunosuppressants. This is a schematic of the treatment allocations during the transitions from the initial one year of the TULIP trials to the long-term extension. Of the 809 patients randomized and treated in either TULIP-1 or TULIP-2, 639 completed treatment in the year-long TULIP studies. 547 of these patients enrolled in the LTE, 257 continued anafrolimab 300 milligrams, and 67 switched from anafrolimab 150 milligrams during TULIP-1 to anafrolimab 300 milligrams in the long-term extension. The 223 patients who had placebo in TULIP-1 or TULIP-2 were re-randomized to anafrolimab 300 milligrams or placebo in the long-term extension. Of 257 patients who had been receiving anafrolimab 300 milligrams throughout, 69% completed the three-year extension study compared with 48% of 112 patients who had been receiving placebo throughout. For the primary safety analysis, the main comparison during the three-year long-term extension study was between the 257 patients randomized to anafrolimab 300 milligrams at the start of TULIP, who also continued to receive anafrolimab 300 milligrams in the long-term extension, and the 112 patients randomized to placebo at the start of TULIP who were re-randomized to receive placebo in the long-term extension. Because treatment exposure in the anafrolimab group was 683.5 patient years compared with 250 0.3 0.3 patient years in the placebo group, the rates of adverse events were assessed using exposure adjusted incidence rates, or EAIRs, per 100 patient years. The exposure adjusted incident rates of any adverse event were 33.1 in the anafrolimab group compared with 37.6 in the placebo group. The most common adverse events in the long-term extension were nasopharyngitis, urinary tract infection, and upper respiratory tract infection. In the long-term extension, exposure-adjusted incident rates of serious adverse events, including events with the outcome of death, were 8.5 for anafrolimab 300 milligrams and 11.2 for placebo. And the most frequently reported types of serious adverse events were in the system organ class of infections and infestations with 4.3 for anafrolimab 300 milligrams and 4.7 for placebo. Looking now at the adverse events of special interest, 
exposure adjusted incidence rates of non-opportunistic serious infections during the LTE were 3.7 for anaphrolamab, 300 milligrams, and 3.6 for placebo. Rates of herpes zoster were 3.4 in the anaphrolamab group and 2.8 in the placebo group. All patients were screened for tuberculosis at study entry. All patients with indeterminate tuberculosis tests at screening were followed up throughout the study and anyone identified with latent tuberculosis was treated with prophylaxis. There were no cases of active tuberculosis reported during the LTE study. Exposure adjusted rates of latent tuberculosis defined by a positive interferon gamma release assay were higher in the LTE anaphrolamab 300 milligram group than in the LTE placebo group. Rates of influenza were 2.2 in the anaphrolamab group and 0.8 in the placebo group. The data I presented on the last slide compared results from the patients who were administered anaphrolamab 300 milligrams throughout the three years of the long-term extension to those who received placebo throughout the three years of the long-term extension. However, in the analyses that follow, data for patients who received anaphrolamab at any dose at any point in the trials defined the all anaphrolamab group, whereas those in the all placebo group included patients who received placebo until, if applicable, they switched to anaphrolamab. The purpose in analyzing the data in this fashion was to potentially uncover rare safety events by maximizing drug exposure. This was accomplished by combining the TULIP Plus long-term extension trials which yielded a total of four years of trial data. Anaphrolimab exposure across the four years was 1,568 patient years, whereas for placebo, the value was 587 patient years. Each increased approximately 2.3 fold over the three-year long-term extension data that I previously discussed. These groups are indicated in the shaded blue and gray boxes. Exposure in the all anaphrolamab group was approximately 2.7 fold greater than that in the all placebo group. The safety profile in the all anaphrolamab group, including patients who had received anaphrolamab for as long as four years, was similar to that of the anaphrolamab 300 milligram group during the three year long term extension period. Across four years, there was a total of 12 deaths, including three previously reported in the TULIP trials and nine in the long-term extension study. 10 of these deaths were in the all anaphrolamab group and two deaths were reported in the all placebo group, giving exposure adjusted incidence rates of 0.6 versus 0.3 respectively. Of the nine deaths that occurred in the long-term extension study, eight patients who died had been treated with anaphrolamab and one patient had been treated with placebo. Rates of herpes zoster in patients in the all anaphrolamab group were 6.8 for year one, 5.7 for year two, 3.9 for year three, and 2.9 for year four. Of note, the herpes zoster vaccine was only licensed for those under 50 years of age toward the end of the long-term extension study, and thus only five patients received herpes zoster vaccinations during the four-year TULIP and LTE treatment periods. While there was one case of anaphylaxis during one of the TULIP trials, there were no instances of anaphylaxis during the three-year long-term extension study. Again, considering across the four years of TULIP and the long-term extension, rates of malignancy were 0.8 with anaphrolamab and 0.7 with placebo, and rates of major acute cardiovascular events were 0.8 and 0.5 respectively. The COVID-19 pandemic was declared on March 11th, 2020, which was about 12 months from the end of the long-term extension. While this study was not designed to assess safety with respect to the COVID-19 pandemic, its occurrence during the latter part of the extension study provided information about anaphrolamab in the context of COVID-19. As the pandemic occurred during the latter part of the extension study, there is further disparity in exposure. Total exposure during the COVID-19 pandemic was 227.7 patient years for anaphrolamab and 42.7 patient years with placebo. 
event rates for COVID related serious adverse events, which were each based on time at risk during the pandemic, were higher in the anafrolimab group compared with the placebo group, 7.2 versus 2.4 per 100 patient years. Of note, asymptomatic positive COVID-19 tests were considered COVID-related events and were therefore included in the total number of events. On this graph, the blue line shows the number of patients receiving anafrolimab 300 milligrams who were still in the trial at a given point in time. And the gray line shows the number remaining in the placebo group. The first black vertical arrow on the left-hand side of the graph indicates the start of the pandemic, and the second vertical line to its right indicates the introduction of COVID-19 vaccines. The three deaths from COVID-19 in the anafrolimab group indicated by the filled triangles occurred in three different countries and within the first six months of the pandemic. Two of these individuals were on immunosuppressants. These deaths occurred prior to the availability of a vaccine or treatments for COVID-19. No COVID-related adverse events occurred in patients after they were fully vaccinated against COVID-19. 21 patients in the anafrolimab 300 milligram group and nine in the placebo group were fully vaccinated against COVID-19 during the study. Now I will switch gears and discuss efficacy. Although it must be emphasized that the primary goal of this extension study was to evaluate safety and tolerability. Efficacy outcomes were exploratory and were assessed in groups of patients who did not change treatments over the four years of the TULIP plus long-term extension period. That is the combined anafrolimab 300 milligram group versus the combined placebo group. The key difference between these combined groups and the LTE anafrolimab 300 milligram and LTE placebo groups was the time frame analyzed. The combined groups include data from years one to four, whereas the LTE period was from years two to four. Mean SLEDI 2K scores decreased from baseline to week 52 in the TULIP period. During the long-term extension, patients in the combined anafrolimab 300 milligram group had greater mean improvement in SLEDA 2K over time compared with the combined placebo group. Solid lines in this figure corresponding to the y-axis on the left demonstrate the mean SLEDA 2K scores over time during the study. Patients in the combined anafrolimab 300 milligram group had a mean SLEDI 2K score of 11.4 at TULIP baseline and 5.1 at week 52, compared with 11.3 at TULIP baseline and 6.0 at week 52 for the combined placebo group. Thus, the graph begins at week 52, the beginning of the long-term extension, and ends at the completion of the long-term extension at week 208 or four years. The SLEDI 2K scores at completion of the long-term extension were 4.0 in the combined anafrolimab 300 milligram group and 3.4 in the combined placebo group. The dotted lines in this figure corresponding to the y-axis on the right demonstrate the mean glucocorticoid doses. The reduction in SLEDI 2K was observed in parallel with reduction of the mean glucocorticoid dose. The proportions of patients stratified by mean glucocorticoid dose levels were evaluated by study year, with study year one on the far left and study year four on the far right. Each histogram pair contains anafrolimab treated patients on the left and placebo treated patients on the right. The legend on the far right displays the four dose ranges. The darkest shaded section of the stack bars represents the highest glucocorticoid dose range with increasingly lighter shades indicating lower glucocorticoid dose ranges. The proportion of patients receiving mean glucocorticoid doses greater than 7.5 milligrams per day was lower in the combined anafrolimab 300 milligram group compared with combined placebo over each year of the four year TULIP and long-term extension period. As highlighted in the fourth pair of bars, at the end of the extension study, 90% of patients in the combined anafrolimab 300 milligram group were taking 
7.5 milligrams or less a day of glucocorticoids compared with 70% of patients in the combined placebo group. 36.4% of patients in the combined anafrolumab 300 milligram group were glucocorticoid free by the end of the extension study compared with 26.8% in the combined placebo group. Flares were assessed using the modified Selena flare index, which includes SLEED A2K. The overall annualized flare rate was 0.1 in the combined anafrolumab 300 milligram group and 0.2 in the combined placebo group. Flares were mostly mild to moderate. The TULIP LTE, to our knowledge, is the longest placebo-controlled trial of a biologic in SLE. Over the four years, no new safety findings were identified. In addition, a reduction in mean sleet I2K, along with a reduction in glucocorticoid use, was observed. Next, let's review the important safety information about Safnello. A contraindication is a known history of anaphylaxis with Safnello, and there are also warnings and precautions that I need to mention. Serious infections and sometimes fatal infections have occurred in patients receiving immunosuppressive agents, including Safnello. Safnello increases the risk of respiratory infections and herpes zoster. Use caution in patients with severe or chronic infections. Avoid initiating treatment during an active infection and consider interrupting therapy in patients who develop a new infection during treatment. Hypersensitivity reaction, including anaphylaxis. Serious hypersensitivity reactions, including anaphylaxis, have been reported following safnello administration. Events of angioedema have also been reported. Other hypersensitivity reactions and infusion-related reactions have occurred following administration of safnello. Safnello should be administered by healthcare providers prepared to manage hypersensitivity reactions, including anaphylaxis and infusion-related reactions. If they occur, immediately interrupt administration and initiate appropriate therapy if a serious infusion-related or hypersensitivity reaction occurs. Malignancy. There is an increased risk of malignancies with the use of immunosuppressants. The impact of safnello on the potential development of malignancies is not known. Immunization. Avoid the use of live or live attenuated vaccines in patients treated with safnello. Use with biologic therapies. Safnello is not recommended for use in combination with other biologic therapies, including B-cell targeted therapies. Adverse reactions. The most common adverse reactions with an incidence of 5% or greater are nasopharyngitis, upper respiratory tract infections, bronchitis, infusion-related reactions, herpes zoster, and cough. In the controlled clinical trials, the incidence of infusion-related reactions was 9.4% in patients while on treatment with safnello and 7.1% in patients on placebo. Infusion-related reactions were mild to moderate in intensity. The most common symptoms were headache, nausea, vomiting, fatigue, and dizziness. Use in specific populations. Pregnancy. A pregnancy exposure registry monitors pregnancy outcomes in women exposed to safnello during pregnancy. For more information about the registry or to report a pregnancy while on safnello, contact AstraZeneca at the number listed on this slide. There are insufficient data on the use of safnello in pregnant women to establish whether there is drug-associated risk for major birth defects or miscarriage. Advise female patients to inform their healthcare provider if they intend to become pregnant during therapy, suspect they are pregnant, or become pregnant while receiving safnello. Lactation. No data are available regarding the presence of safnello in human milk the effects on the breastfed child, or the effects on milk production. Pediatric use. The safety and efficacy of safnello in pediatric patients less than 18 years of age has not been established. Thank you very much for taking the time to listen to these important data from the long-term extension study of anaphrolumab.